Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our learning circle, helping undocumented students pay for college. I want to also thank you for all that you are doing to support undocumented students in their quest for college education. I'm Candy Marshall. I have the opportunity to lead the Dream.us, which is the nation's largest college access and success program for undocumented immigrant youth. The moment I say that, I then also have to say it's not hard to be the largest because there aren't that many who are doing what we're doing. And we, of course, would love there to be far more and have someone surpass us. I'm also joined by Sadana Singh, who is our program and communications manager, and she will manage all of the logistics for our webinar, including gathering your questions and running our polls. Before we start, I have just a few housekeeping items and to make sure I get these correctly, I'm actually gonna read them to you. In your handout panel, which should be to your right, you'll find this PowerPoint. You can download it now if you wish by clicking on handouts, but we will also email it to you tomorrow along with a recording of the session. In your chat box, we have included some links to other resources and there are links throughout our PowerPoint and we've tried to highlight those in a different color so that you can find them and those will be available to you on what we send tomorrow. We will have two periods when you're able to ask questions and you can do so in two different ways. In your control panel, you will see hand icon. Press this icon to raise your hand and ask a question using your voice. Sedona will call on you and unmute you. And then you'll of course need to make sure that you're unmuted on your own device. Also in the control panel, you'll see a question box where you can type in your questions. And during the Q&A periods, we'll do our best to answer questions submitted in the Q&A box. And we'll do a Q&A session after each of our panels. Today's session is co-sponsored by the Dream.us, as I just mentioned, but also importantly, by the President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration. And that alliance has grown quickly, is now over 400 members, college and university presidents who are committed to helping the public understand how immigration policies and practices impact students, campuses, and communities. And Miriam is joining us. She's gonna be one of our panelists today, but we cannot thank them enough for all that they are doing to advocate for protections for dreamers. Today's session is in two parts. The first learning circle is on income sharing agreements which is an emerging new pay it forward model to help students pay for college. The second session is on financial and scholarship aid for dreamers. We have much to cover and we're gonna move at a fast clip. So I'm going to apologize in advance that I'm gonna be a bit of a time master. We are fortunate to have six presenters with us today who will share their journeys in addressing financial barriers that are facing undocumented immigrant youth in paying for college. Their names and email addresses are listed here. I'm gonna introduce the panels just before they speak, but all have agreed that you are more than welcome to reach out to them after this session if you have additional follow on questions. So let's get started. We wanna start with a couple poll questions so we can learn just a little bit more about our audience, which is continuing to grow as I speak. Uh, so Sedana, if you'll launch our first poll question. So our first poll question is, are you representing a private or public institution? Um, we're gonna leave it open for a little bit more. I see 78% of you have voted. So I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds, keep voting and then I'll close it. All right, we're close to 90%. I'll go ahead and close it and I will share the results. And you'll have to read the results uh, to us, Sedona, because I'm not able to see them. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so the question was, are you representing a private or public institution? And we had 30% select private and 70% select public. Okay, good, thank you. And one more poll question, if you'd be so kind. 
Yes. Our second poll question is, what is your estimate of the number of undocumented students attending your institution? Please select your choice. We are almost 70% voted, keep voting. All right, we are close to 90, so I'm going to go ahead and close it and share the results. So the question, what is your estimate of the number of undocumented students attending your institution? Zero to 50, we had 29%. 51 to 100, we had 6%. 101 to 200, we had 6%. Over 200, we had 40%, wow. and do not know, 19%. All right, I will once again thank you. These are really strong numbers. So thank you for all of you for helping serve undocumented students in your institutions. Very appreciative of it. All right, I'm just gonna quickly set the stage for uh, both panel discussions by giving you a state of play for DREAMers. So uh, what you'll find here is a slide on DACA and TPS very quickly. Undocumented high school students can no longer apply for DACA. I should back up one second. I think you're all aware that in September of 2017, the administration uh, announced that it was ending DACA. At that point in time, students could no longer apply. So the unfortunate circumstance for our, our students who are graduating from high school is they do not have lawful presence. They could be deported at any time. They're not able to work to support their families nor to be able to afford their college education. Those who had DACA are still able to renew and that is only because we have had three courts that have put in place temporary restraining orders or injunctions saying that Trump it appears that Trump has unlawfully rescinded DACA. All three courts, I want to be clear, have stated that Trump absolutely has the, the ability to lawfully rescind DACA, but he just hasn't done so yet. So this status where DACA holders can renew is fabulous, but it is likely short-lived. It could take about a year and a half, maybe two years for these court cases to wind their, their way through the court system, but at some point in time, we should all expect that unless Congress acts, DACA will indeed go away. The administration is also phasing out TPS. We had just a little bit of relief in the last couple of weeks when they announced that for Haitians, they would extend it another six months. But we should all understand that the intent is that it will be phased out. And then I have a comment here about no protective legislation until with a big question mark. Uh, we have continually hoped that Congress would act at various points. They have not yet. Uh, there was a House Judiciary Committee meeting this week uh, where our own Don Graham, one of our founders, testified. We have some hope that a bill may be introduced in the next two weeks, but I would have to be honest with you to say we're not overly optimistic that anything will be passed in the current state. Uh, if it is not, that would then likely mean that it wouldn't be until 2020 post-election, and of course it would depend on those election reports, results as to whether or not we would get any protection for DREAMers. The number one barrier for undocumented students going to college and staying in college is finances. Simple as that. Uh, less than one half of our states have legislation providing in-state tuition. There are more states that get to in-state tuition either through policy and or practice. And in fact, in some states, it's simply a don't ask, don't tell practice. Only a handful of states provide state or institutional aid. Loans are generally not available to DREAMers. Uh, that's in California, there's an exception there. And at least for our scholars, of which we now have 3,400 enrolled in 75 colleges, 73% of our scholars are working one to three jobs to pay for college and support their family. So they are in a very tenuous position should they lose DACA. So with that, I now want to turn uh, to our first panel discussion. And uh, what I would say about this is difficult times require innovative solutions. So recognizing that DREAMers access to federal financial aid is some time in coming, 
we at the dream.us have started to look at different models where we might be able to have sustainable funding for dreamers. And one of the models that we were introduced to was the model of an income sharing agreement referred to as ISAs. And we're very intrigued by the model and we're learning more and we wanna share our journey with you and I've invited a few experts to the table to do that. Before we jump in, I'd like to do a quick poll question just to find out where you are in your journey with regard to ISAs. So, so Donna, if you can launch that. All right, here's our next poll. Please tell us where you are in your ISA journey. We're at about 70% voted, so keep voting. We have a couple more seconds. All right, we're just about 86%, so I'll go ahead and close and share the results. So where are you in your ISA journey? ISA is a new concept for me, 73%. I have heard of ISAs but want to learn more, 25%. I have implemented or administered an ISA, 2%. All right. And for those who say that they have administered, feel free to jump in in the course of the session today if you have anything to add. Uh, I am now pleased to introduce Kevin James, who is the founder and CEO of Better Future Forward, which I'll refer to as BFF. Uh, BFF is partnering with community-based organizations like College Possible, many of us familiar with them, and local colleges to offer college students fund funding through income sharing agreements that both help them pay for college, but um, also give them the support services they need to ensure that they're going to be successful in college. Kevin will introduce the basic concept of an ISA to us, and then we'll hear from Jack Kent Cook Foundation, which is now funding an ISA, and Colorado Mountain College, which has just implemented its first ISA. So Kevin, over to you. And let me know, Kevin, when you need me to switch a slide. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Candy. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to participate. This is it's such an honor. I think I've been working on ISAs for a long time, and I think this is an idea that it is still very new in the grand scheme of higher education. Um, it's often misunderstood, but can have um, potentially dramatic uh, benefits for for students in general. But I think particularly for dreamers who face the challenges that we're talking about today. And so let me talk to you briefly about um, the basic contours of an ISA, and then we'll talk about um, how to think about them in the context of, of a dreamer population if you're thinking about implementing them. So this slide just gives you sort of the basics. So the biggest thing to think about with an ISA is that with a loan, you're essentially taking amount of, a fixed amount of money and you're agreeing to pay it until you've paid uh, the money back with interest. And loans obviously have a term length, but the term is, is somewhat artificial in the sense that you ultimately will keep paying until you've paid the loan back. With an ISA, it's built much more around time than it is a loan balance. And so um, you're agreeing to basically pay for a fixed time, uh, maybe eight years or 10 years, and you're paying a percentage of your income over that time. And so there's no fixed amount that you have to pay back. Um, you ultimately could pay zero under an ISA and be done after the time. Your obligation is just to pay a percentage of your income and the ultimate amount that you pay depends on the income that you earn over that time period. And so there's also protections um, in all ISA programs for students who are earning a low amount. So for example, it's it's typically called an income threshold. And if you're earning below, for example, $20,000 or $27,000, this, this varies by program, um, you'd have no obligation in those years. And so students who truly come out of school and earn a low amount of income, particularly over the whole time period, would be free of the obligation after the time and, and truly have never paid anything. And so um, this is this is a core feature of the ISA that's different from loans, is it's it's a tool to get students the money they need for school, but in a way that doesn't impose on them the dramatic financial risk that can come with, with loans. And so oftentimes people, when I talk to students, they'll say, 
how can you do that? Is this entirely philanthropic? Is it designed to lose money? How does this work? Um, essentially, what we try and convey to them is it's, it's built so that students who end up doing well end up earning more than they expect, end up paying more, so that a student could end up paying more than they would with a loan, they could end up paying more than the amount they received, and really it's designed so that some students pay more, some students technically pay less, but everyone pays according to their, their after school income and thus always has a manageable obligation. And all ISAs have some kind of cap so that if you become Mark Zuckerberg, you're not paying a billion dollars back to this thing. And so students have protections both on the low end and the high end of the ISA. Um, Candy, go forward. Okay. Oops, sorry. There you go. So just a brief history that this concept of an ISA, actually, it, it goes, there's names in the past, income contingent financing, income-based lending. There's, there's, it, it's really an intellectual history that goes back about 50 or 60 years. And a lot of this has manifested itself in government programs. So you see in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, they have universal income-based systems uh, through the government. Um, where students can get money for school and, and every student pays as a percentage of their income and it's done through the payroll withholding sim uh, system for simplicity. In the U.S., we have these programs as well, but we went in a different direction and decided to create the most Byzantine system ever devised by man. Um, we have a complicated array of repayment options and, and different options. Um, so we, we have a thread of this idea, but not a very well implemented version of it. There's also been a lot of, I would say a lot, some private sector activity over time that's grown dramatically in the past few years. And so Lumini is a company based in Latin America that's done about 10,000 students uh, with ISAs, many of them low income. Um, Purdue University in the U.S. in 2015 became probably the most recognized institution for doing the first large scale institutional ISA program that serves probably a thousand students now over the past three years. There's also been a tremendous amount of boot camp activity in, uh, in the workforce sector with a lot of short term coding boot camps implementing some kind of ISA model, um, sometimes even completely in lieu of tuition. Um, and then there's been there's other providers in the space. Um, so I should not forget Better Future Forward. We have we have been out there. Um, our focus, as Candy mentioned, has been. We're a nonprofit and we're building ISA programs with a specific focus on low income populations. Um, working with college access programs to provide pathways within communities to help them get to a college degree. Um, we're certainly not the only provider. Um, there's others. Um, Demo is one that has built, and, and um, Colorado, Matt from Colorado Mountain College, and certainly speak, um, they have engaged with them. Um, and Demo worked with Purdue to build their program. And so there's, there's certainly other providers in the space that are doing this as well. Go ahead, Candy. Okay. Um, I'll just give you a quick example to show you sort of mechanically how an ISA might operate in the context of a student. Um, I, I've shown this example student, Tasha, who's a freshman and needs about $8,000 per year. And so typically a student in one of our programs, for example, but this is fairly common, would come and say that they need a certain amount of money. And there's typically limits, so you'd say, you wouldn't typically give students beyond their unmet need. You wouldn't uh, you typically put parameters around how much of their their income that they can commit to protect them, to make sure they don't have an unaffordable obligation. But within that, they'd say how much money they need, and and you'd say, okay, you'd agree to pay two percent of income, for example. And this is varies by program, but it's usually um, built on a financial model that says, okay, here's how much the percentage of income should be for a certain amount of money. And so in her first year, she would say agree to pay 2% of income for 10 years in exchange for $8,000. If she comes back in her second year and needs another $8,000, she would agree again to pay 2% of income. And then if she did that in the remainder of her college career, she would in the end have received um, $8,000 for each year and agreed to pay 8% of her income in total over 10 years. So there's no principal balance in the end. There's just her agreement to pay 8,000, uh, excuse me, 8% of her income. And you can see here in this slide, this is just sort of an example of what her payments and income might look like. 
And so as her income grows, her payments um, can grow with her income. And if she has periods when she's below, in this case, our hypothetical threshold of $25,000 per year, she would have no payment obligation in those years. And so again, this is just to show you how the, the payment obligations really adjust with her ability to pay over time. Um, you can go ahead, Candy. And so this is this is often a very new concept, and it's not it's not one you might necessarily come to intuitively. And so it's 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 critical, particularly for something that's new that we think about whether it is in the best interest of students, and often a situation where it may be a good tool for some students and not for others. There might be some students who aren't comfortable with it, and that I think the element of all of this through how this puts you. Um, critically to help many students and, and so um, these are design considerations that we've thought about. The first is transparency, that this is just a very new tool. It, it's foreign to a lot of people and it has properties that are very different from loans, but ones that can be very protective, but just being very transparent with students, making sure that they understand what they're getting into, um, being open about the terms, that's a principle we think should be in all of these programs. A second is protecting students from burdensome payments. This is, even though ISAs are tied to your future income, a student committing 50% of their income would not have a manageable obligation. So fleshing out how you think about what is an appropriate amount of mon money to give a student to help them while protecting them in their future, I think that's, a, that's an important responsibility in any of these programs. Broad access is just thinking about trying to reach all the students who can benefit in your eligibility criteria. So we think about this um, in terms of really um, a lot of our programs are built around either a 2.5 GPA or a, a satisfactory academic progress standard in terms of who can, what students can be eligible. Forward-looking underwriting is trying to take a different approach than what has been common in the common in the past. So traditionally, student lending has all entirely been about your credit score or the credit score of a co-signer. These programs generally um, have been around um, the quality of the investment the student is making, so long as they're going to a good institution um, and uh, doing what they need to do academically, this, these programs have been available to them. Um, another principle we've evolved is, is just trying to be responsive to their needs. There's a lot of situations students find themselves in, they end up with prior balances uh, that they can't pay through other means. Um, living costs are a critical element of these programs. And so thinking through um, beyond just tuition and fees, how you can be responsive to the unique challenges that these students face. Because this is a tool that, that potentially can financially meet those different obligations and give students a better chance of success. And lastly, it's just using research to understand how this is actually impacting students. So this is about more than just how many ISAs can we originate, but are we actually meaningfully uh, altering the trajectories of these students, helping them stay in school and graduate, work less, um, and, and altering other outcomes that we know are important for them? Go ahead, Candy. And lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about the context of ISAs and DREAMers. Um, DACA is, is certainly central to this. It's DACA, as Candy was saying, provides legal work authorization for students. And so on the payment side, in terms of being able to, ISAs um, rely on being able to document students' income and, and have a process where you can tie their payments to their income and having legal work authorization is, is very critical to that. It's not, I won't say it's impossible to do ISAs without it, but it I think it can ensure a much cleaner and more um, uh, fair process for students. And so um, we, as we thought about incorporating DREAMers in our programs, um, have thought about we would probably make DACA an eligibility criteria for students who want to participate. The obvious question that comes up is how to think about DACA and the policy uncertainty around that program. I think. One way to approach this is that ISAs have the potential to create something that DREAMers can access the money they need in a way that protects them um, and can do so at scale because they create 
a payment stream back from students that essentially can help to sustain and grow the program for other students. And this is particularly important because it can unlock sources of, of capital to help these students that may have not been available in the future, such as program related investments or other philanthropic investments um, that can come in much larger scales than typical grant dollars. And so it's important in thinking about these investments that you speak candidly with investors that this is an area that's uncertain. We don't know how DACA will play out, but certainly giving away scholarships, you know the money's gone. Um, this is a way to potentially recoup money um, from these students. Uh, we know they're likely to do well and create something that can leverage dollars much more efficiency, efficiently. So I think that transparency is important. And lastly, I think just getting started is, is important. Um, these students will be in school for a while and it's gonna take time to build out these programs and learn about them. And so just getting something started, building the momentum so that when we do have clarity around DACA, we're at a point where this can grow much larger rather than starting fresh, I think is, is something that would help accelerate this quite a bit. So I'll, I'll pause there and certainly can take questions later, but thank you again for letting me participate. Good, thank you, Kevin. And now what I'm gonna do, this says let's hear from the experts. It should say from the other experts because Kevin is also, of course, an expert. Let me introduce Rashawn atkins Roan, who is Chief of Staff at Jack Kent Cook Foundation and very much took a lead in Jack Kent Cook's in, uh, investment, its first program-related investment in BFF's College Possible ISA Fund. And as stated by the head of Jack Kent Cook, they did this to improve the futures of even more students while building momentum for ISAs as a new engine of opportunity and equity in higher education. And then followed by Rashan, we'll have Matt Gineshi, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Colorado Mountain College. Matt helped lead Colorado Mountain College's creation of Fund Sueños, a, and it's a pilot ISA to augment aid for its DACA students. So we're going to start with Sean to tell us about your journey, and then we'll hear from Matt. Thanks so much, uh, Candy, for inviting us, and thank you, Kevin, um, who I think is the best in the business in terms of explaining income share agreements in ways that we can all understand. So appreciate that. Uh, the mission of the Jack Kent Cook Foundation is to advance the education of high achieving students with financial need. We primarily do that through our scholarship programs <clears throat> where we provide up to $40,000 a year for high school graduating seniors and community college students to transfer to accredited uh, colleges and universities to complete their bachelor's degrees. Our scholarships are provided without regard to citizenship status or, or legal status. Um, and, and we understand that finances are the number one barrier for students with financial need to pursuing their educations, particularly at the types of institutions that would best serve them. Um, to date, we've awarded over uh, $150 million to 2,500 scholarship uh, students, uh, 2,500 of our scholars, um, but we realize that this is just a small number of the many students who could benefit from um, support in their financing. So we also advance our mission through our thought leadership, our research on high achieving students with financial needs and our philanthropic investments, which include our traditional grants, but have increasingly included program related investments. Um, and with these PRIs, we have an opportunity to um, fund pilot projects, um, solutions that have the potential to scale broadly um, and that are really innovative. And that was uh, the primary reason that we decided to invest in an ISA with Better Future Forward in College Possible. Um, we realize the potential of income share agreements and became very concerned that um, the student population that we advocate for, higher achieving students with financial need, may not be um, included or served well by other ISAs and really wanted to work with a partner to de develop the kind of equity-based ISA that um, Kevin outlined. 
I think it's important to note that this partnership between the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, Better Future Forward, and IS and College Possible um, is not a traditional ISA arrangement where potentially the, the institution is the major um, um, funder and backer of the ISA program. Um, and those ISAs definitely have their place, and I encourage all those on the phone to think about how their institutions can invest in ISAs and bring um, the, the, the promise of ISAs to your campus. We also very much wanted to provide one of these proof points Kevin talked about for how college access partners working with private philanthropic capital could um, develop a model for ISAs to serve students across a number of different institutions. So we're really proud of that work. Um, and as Kevin said, it's important to get started, even that if that is a, a, a small start um, and a few students, as we build the case for ISAs in general, but really for equitably designed ISAs, where the protections that Kevin mentioned are in place for all of our students, um, and they're not subject to um, more predatory, if you will, practices. So I'll pause there, um, and giving that little bit of a background and, and maybe see to the next speaker, and we can take questions after that. Good. Thank you, Rashawn. Matt, let's jump to you. We've got a map of your expansive network. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I apologize to uh, the participants uh, that my my camera uh, appears to not be working. It was a it was a good hair day, and you're missing that, so apologize. <laughs> um, first thing I wanted to do, um, and and I completely agree with everything that Kevin has shared, and I'm a fan of his writing, and um, so I won't um, go over um, much of what he shared, but say that um, our program very much is in alignment um, with uh, the concepts that were shared uh, from Kevin and Rashawn. Uh, first is, is I wanted to make sure that everybody understands Colorado Mountain College and who we are and where we are so that you can get a context uh, for uh, the work that we're doing and why we did what we did. Um, so Colorado Mountain College, you can see uh, this is effectively a, state, a, a map of the state of Colorado. Um, Colorado Mountain College uh, represents everything uh, west of, um, sort of the Denver metro area um, through to about Grand Junction. I mean, so it's many of the towns people know, um, Aspen, Vail, uh, Glenwood Springs, Eagle Springs, Dillon, Breckenridge, and the like. Um, sorry, there's some feedback. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, yeah, I don't think that's... There we go. Okay. Um, in many of these communities, obviously, that we serve are affluent communities, um, but the students we serve at the, at the college, uh, we're an access institution, the students we serve um, are often the labor force um, that makes these uh, communities work. And so understand that the students that we serve are very much um, students whose parents um, maybe uh, immigrated to the to the region to work in a hotel, uh, to work in the service sector, and so that's very much um, a part of who we are. So that's uh, the affluence is not the typical enrollment of our student. Uh, actually, our, our enrollment is a much more diverse um, group of students who um, are closer to the margins than one might expect um, looking at uh, the map. Over the years, uh, the college um, has um, it served undocumented students in a variety of ways. We certainly have our foundation um, that has provided scholarship support. Um, we have very affordable tuition. Our tuition, books, and fees all in um, is about $3,000 a year total. Um, and so um, we have been trying to both create affordability uh, for our students as well as um, provide the kinds of uh, scholarship opportunities for the students as well. We realized, however, um, in serving, we serve, we think, about 300 um, undocumented students um, in our region, maybe more, but that's the number that we've been using uh, based upon some tuition classification um, uh, numbers that we've looked at. Um, we realized that we needed to put more tools in the toolbox uh, for our students and to provide them with more opportunities than simple fundraising uh, to provide scholarships for them. As a note, Colorado is not a state that currently provides um, uh, financial assistance to uh, students. They do allow for in-state in tuition status for undocumented students, uh, but we do not allow financial support uh, through traditional financial aid. That may be changing soon, um, but that is uh, the current uh, context. 
as an institution, we decided that uh, we were not going to sit around and wait for an answer, um, either from Congress or from our own state legislature. And so we decided to jump in to the ISA um, uh, realm um, and pilot a program, uh, which we began last year, which we call Fund Sueños. Um, it was actually helped, uh, the name uh, was derived by a focus group and some students that we were working with. Um, What's different about our ISA than other traditional ISAs around the country that you may have read about um, is that ours is uh, completely philanthropically underwritten. So we have donors um, that are providing money to the CMC Foundation, um, and that is the, the corpus of funds that we use uh, to disperse um, ISA uh, support to our students. Um, why we went with a philanthropically underwritten uh, program uh, it has a couple of uh, reasons. Um, on the one hand, it also it allows us with greater flexibility so that we're not using public resources. And so um, that, that allows us to um, uh, have some relief from the constraints uh, that would otherwise be present um, had we used public dollars. The second is, is um, you heard earlier that um, the status of DACA um, is is still um, somewhat volatile, um, and so we wanted to um, go into a relationship where our donors were willing uh, to provide the support, but understood um, that should DACA law changes, uh, that we would vacate um, any of the students' outstanding obligations to the institution, and we couldn't do that with um, funds if we either owed a bank, or we owed an investor, or we owed ourselves to the state. Um, the only way we felt like we could do that authentically was to do it through philanthropy. A couple of other quick things and then I'll, well, we'll answer questions. Um, the first is, is that we have a 1.0 limit um, and that's as people start to learn about ISAs, you'll start to hear terminology around limits. Um, and this is the maximum amount of repayment uh, that a student would, would pay. Um, we have um, not increased the repayment above what is actually um, borrowed, if you will, uh, by the students. And so there's, quote, no profit, uh, no profit of any kind um, in, in our uh, program. The other is, is we raised um, the minimum salary needed uh, for a student um, to begin their payment process or their uh, income sharing to $30,000. Uh, we live in a very high cost region and so um, we, there were actually arguments to make that even higher, uh, but we felt like 30000 as a minimum starting salary uh, would be the minimum limit uh, that we would enact uh, for students to begin their process. Um, and then finally, we targeted um, our students who could finish in a year or less, so we're in that pilot phase right now. The reason why we did this is, um, as uh, Rashawn said, uh, we wanted to have a proof point um, so that we could talk to others to help understand um, what the impact of this program was. And we wanted to start with students who were close enough to making the transition into the workforce. Um, so that's where we, we targeted our pilot in this first year. One side note, and then I'll finish, is that uh, we, uh, in creating this program, and you'll see that we have a website, we have a fact sheet. So um, any, anyone who's interested, please uh, go there for other details. But uh, the Lumina Foundation did provide us with a grant um, to produce uh, three documents uh, that we will make public in the next year. Uh, the first is, is that we, are, uh, we have contracted with a law firm um, to do a legal analysis um, of the um, what are the uh, the, the uh, legal parameters um, that enable an institution to participate um, in an income sharing agreement with students of varying statuses, so whether they're DACA or undocumented or otherwise, um, that will be coming in the next uh, three to four months. A second one is that we um, have a behavioral analysis um, being done um, to um, uh, work with the students who are participants to better understand what their approach was um, to the ISA and whether or not they behave in ways that are predictable, um, given uh, you know comparing them to say a student, a traditional student loan uh, student or other kinds of financial aid. So we'll be producing that soon as well. And then the final one is we're doing a financial analysis on student price sensitivity and the behaviors that we saw uh, based upon uh, their uh, access to um, this type of a program. Um, and so those uh, will all be coming in the next year and we'll be making those public so that others can learn from our experience um, in, in going through this project. Thank you. Thank you, that was fabulous. I have a couple seed questions I am going to put to this group, but I also welcome now all of our attendees to start to either raise your hand or type in questions. So let mm -hmm. me just start with a couple of them. One, I'd love to hear you talk about how this has been received by students. We did just, I couldn't say that we did formal focus groups, but we did put the question to some of our graduates in, in sessions with our alumni and asked them if they could go back in time, how would they have received this concept? 
And what they seemed to really like about it was this idea of paying it forward, that they would be able to get funding, they would share their income back into a fund that could then be used to fund follow on dreamers. But I'd love to hear from you your experience. So Kevin, I know you did some very formal focus groups. Perhaps you could give a quick answer. And Matt, you might have some perspective on this as well. And I'm not hearing anyone speak. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so we've, we've done a lot of speaking with students in different forums, and um, it is, I mean, it, it always comes through that it's a new idea and it takes them a little while to understand it in general. We get, we sort of go through a funny progression with students where they have a concept of a loan in their head, and so they think about it as a loan, and even as you tell the story, they still think about it as a loan, and then they ask about prepayment and other things that, um, and you, you have to kind of say several times, you really just pay this percentage of your income and you can be done at the end regardless. And um, then they usually flip into another mode when they say, how is this possible? Like this is, I've had students say, this is socialism. We live in a capitalist country, this is impossible. Um, and so um, really helping them understand that this is something where they can pay more or less depending on their income. But really I think then the thing that is most meaningful to them is what you said, Candy, that they um, they don't like this to be just a financial tr transaction. They like the notion of um, supporting their future students, um, feeling like this is coming from others who have their best interest at heart. Um, I think this would be very different if it were just a, a Wells Fargo ISA program versus one sponsored by a school or a nonprofit with that, that social aspect to it. Okay. Yeah. So this, Matt, um, I, I agree. Um, we had a focus group with our um, students and their families. Um, we had a very large turnout, actually, um, to talk about this concept. And we had somewhat uh, equal um, uh, curious skepticism um, when we first uh, introduced the idea. And the students, um, in following up with them and, and the ones who are participating in our program, um, by far, the motive, the most important thing for them, aside from providing the financial support, was the concept of paying it back to the next generation, um, and that was critical. Um, and so that is just, it's a very important concept, I mean, that the, at least in our case, our funds go back, all repayments go back into the corpus, and then that corpus gets reallocated back to another group of students who would benefit from the very same uh, fund, um, and so uh, we'll see how that works. I'd offer one additional um, thing that I think uh, we didn't, um, you know, it really wasn't our initial motivating uh, factor, but um, this idea of repayment also is has been helping us from a fundraising standpoint. So we have donors that believe that they'll have more than the, sort of a single terminal use of, of, of a fund where they can give away one scholarship in one year and then that may be all they can provide. We have donors, we have people in the college, we have faculty members and others who are writing small checks every month to participate in this program. So their capacity may not be um, dramatic, um, but uh, they know that those funds uh, will, be, will be regenerating uh, so that those those dollars will go out to a group of students and then we'll be able to come back to the students or come back to a new group of students over time. And so that has been important for us as, as far as fundraising um, and, and conveying the message and, and why this is functionally different than a traditional program. Good. That was very helpful and fed into what was my next question, which was how has this been received by donors? Uh, so Donna, are we getting any questions that we should start answering? Yes, so we actually have one raised hand. Um, Natalie Grandison, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. Hi, Great. Natalie. Um, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this very informative um, and examples about ISAs and how they're actually being implemented. I have a question around the repayment structure. So the example that uh, was provided for the student who was only paying 8% of her income. Is that amount also taking into account other student loan debt that that student might have, say from federal Stafford loans or additional private loans that they had taken out and are, the family is now using the ISA to fill that extra gap? I'm happy to respond to that. Um, 
basically it's in our programs at least and i think this is consistent with what's generally done is that it would be done more upfront. so for example in when when a student comes to us and asks for a certain amount of money we look at their other obligations and say um, here's the burden that we expect these will impose on you and we limit the amount of so we could potentially give them the amount of money they ask for if, if everything seems okay but it could also be a situation where we'll say unfortunately we can only give you half of what you've asked for because um, we want to keep your overall after school burden manageable good i'll also add this is sort of a sad statement the issue of debt is not so relevant for dreamers because unfortunately they don't get any federal loans and they generally aren't able to get private loans so uh, it, interestingly enough it becomes less of a key issue but the point is still the same that and i think you all of our panelists have mentioned this the importance of making sure that we're not overloading the student with payment obligations that they wouldn't be able to meet uh Sidani, any other questions that have come up Yes, we have some questions in the chat box. First question, is this only for DACA students with work authorization? What about students with no social security number who are who are undocumented? Okay, and Matt, is your program DACA only? So that, that's a very apropos question. Um, yes, we targeted our first pilot uh, for DACA students only, um, mainly because that was the group that we knew that uh, not only did they have work authorization, but uh, think about the um, institutional or the structures that have to be in place um, to, to follow a student once they enter the workforce. So um, in our case, we have a provider um, that uh, is, uh, going to um, go through the process of um, ensuring that they can um, you know, track the student. If the student goes from Colorado and moves to Texas, that they'll be able to um, work with that student out of state, um, that they also work with their bank um, so that that student has authority to open up an account and to have regular payroll. And so what we were doing in our pilot, at least, was to start with the students that we knew had the capacity um, or the authorization to make the system function as it's been designed. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have that Lumina uh, project where we are uh, analyzing the legal implications of working with somebody without work authorization. And there, that raises some other questions, of course. Um, and it's not um, raising questions about need. It's more questions about how can you, can you use um, an instrument that um, necessarily and by design uh, will put a student into some form of uh, indebtedness um, to another institution. Um, how do you deal with things like collections? What happens if the if you have somebody who ends up, um, you know, in some kind of legal trouble? Um, and so, w without having the um, ability to have sort of the, the regular ISA system function. Um, we're just not sure exactly how that'll how those systems will be treated and what kinds of modifications would be needed so at least in our case we started with the daca students we recognize that there are other students who need the support um, but we're going to learn through through this year on both how it works as well as what the legal implications are uh, for setting up a program for somebody without work authorization okay good and kevin i know you'd already mentioned that daca would be a focus i will mention that even with the loss of daca Undocumented students will still be able to work. As we know, they can work as independent contractors, set up tax identification numbers. And in fact, many undocumented immigrants across this nation every day are working and paying taxes, even though they don't have DACA or TPS. So there is some window there, but at least in these early stages, I understand why people are tying it to DACA. So Donna, maybe one, two other questions, and then sadly, I need to move us forward. Okay, uh, this question is actually a two-parter, so we can just go with that. Uh, okay. The first part is, how do you ensure that students repay? And the second part is, please share where the startup funds come from if you are in a state that is not supportive of undocumented students. I, I can provide a quick response on the chime in. Okay, and so payment process. Answer that one. Matt, Sorry, you can want you to hear me? Yes. Um, I can provide a quick response that students, in some sense, this is no different than any other unsecured obligation. Students come out of school and they submit 
some kind of documentation of their income, um, like a pay stub, and that establishes their monthly payments. If their income changes, they can uh, basically call their servicer and change it, and they submit a 1040 uh, tax return at the end of the year to document their income for the year. And so they that establishes their income, and they, they are required to make payments and to agree that they choose not to. Um, there can be credit reporting or other things that basically you have the same tools at your disposal that you would as any other unsecured creditor at that point. Um, and so uh, I'll I'll pause there and let anyone else weigh in who wants to. Matt or Sean, any any comments? Sure, Candy. I'll just respond on the question for for funding, um, as a private foundation um, looking to invest in this type of model, I think organizations might reach out to donors, as Mar uh, Matt was able to demonstrate at CMC, um, but also foundations in your area. There, there are two separate types of potential funding. Grant funding, um, which Matt talks about, enables you to do that 1x sort of um, ISA cap um, and, and have a bit more flexibility, whereas the type of investment that we provide it for an ISA, um, there are there is a return to the foundation on that investment. So approaching grant funding differently from investment funding is something that I would I would recommend, but would be happy to talk with anyone interested in, in talking with private foundations about that. Good. All right. And I'll just close it. In fact, some uh, universities, including Purdue, actually have used their endowment and see the ISA as an investment vehicle that would have some return. The idea would be the monies would go back into the fund, so it could be a one-to-one, -one, but there could be a return back uh, to an investor. And of course, there are even private equity investors who have thought about establishing these. I think that's where people get increasingly concerned about predatory practices. Uh, but many different avenues for the funding. So with that, let me thank this panel. I, uh, it's uh, definitely what we've done is put a toe in the water. I encourage you to reach back out to these panelists to get more information. And with that, I'm going to move us forward and we're going to do some poll questions. And while we'll do that, I invite our current panelists to turn your cameras off and our incoming panelists to turn your cameras on. So Tanya, uh, Sadana, if you can launch the poll questions. All right, our next poll question. Do you have any institutional aid or other scholarship programs that are available to undocumented students? We're about 55% voted, so keep voting for a few more seconds. All right, we're about 80%. I'll go ahead and close and share the results. So the question was, do you have any institutional aid or other scholarship programs that are available to undocumented students? 72% said yes, 28% said no, and 0% said do not know. All right, that is fabulous news that 72% of you are already well on your way to do this. Uh, the next poll question, Sadana. All right, our next poll question is, what is your major concern about opening institutional or private scholarship aid to DREAMers? We're at 55% voted, so please keep putting in your answers for a few more seconds. All right, I'll go ahead and close and share the results. Okay, the question was, what is your major concern about opening institutional or private scholarship aid to DREAMers? Loss of current or future donors, 13%. Loss of support of political, business, or community leaders, 11%. 
Legal constraints on public institutions, 51%. Other legal implications, 24%. All right, that's very helpful for us and for the panel as we move forward. I'm gonna jump right in and through these next few, few slides quickly, I apologize, but I really do wanna get us to our panel. Uh, with regard to the availability of in-state tuition and state aid, here are just a few suggestions you're gonna hear about. Uh, advocating for an in-state or reduced rate, we're gonna hear about that from Missy from uh, ASU. Extending regional reciprocity agreements, many of you are members of these uh, regional organizations. Oregon, Western Oregon University did this in order to accept undocumented students from outside the state by using the 150% rate. Uh, seeking an AG opinion on the availability of in-state tuition or state aid that's happened both in Virginia and Washington state. So it was done via matter of policy, not legislation. Using tuition waivers, uh, available to out-of-state students. This has been done both in Florida and it's being done by one college in uh, Illinois. And these are tuition waivers that in the past used to be used for people like athletes. And uh, since uh, the state says, well, these students are out-of-state students, uh, the colleges are saying, all right, we'll treat them as such and we'll give them tuition waivers. And then finally, for private institutions, classifying undocumented students as domestic versus international students. And Miriam, I'm hoping you'll spe spend a little time speaking to that. Uh, with regard to scholarship programs, very quickly, we have discovered in our journey that some scholarship programs are silent about the citizenship requirement, but it's just simply assumed. And upon examination, organizations have realized there is no restriction and they can open them up. Others have what I refer to as the copy and paste mode. They looked at another scholarship program. They copied the, the eligibility criteria. It had U.S. citizenship and they adopted it without any thought. And when they revisit it, they realize it doesn't need to be a criteria. And then there are, of course, those that actually do have an intentional exclusion. And that's where, of course, more difficult conversations might be needed to make a change. In terms of what stands in the way, and you all have been talking about this, uh, much of your concern is around the it's unlawful to award scholarships to undocumented students. Certainly using institutional aid, that is true in many states, but using private scholarship aid, it generally is not true. And in fact, there is little to no legal uh, um, um, issue or concern in this area, so long as you're using private scholarship aid. And I'm gonna have ASU speak to that. Uh, fear that the donors will not support. Uh, we've raised $200 million, so clearly it has not been a concern for at least our donors, but uh, President, President Smarelli from CBU can speak to this because he's been in quite a fundraising mode. And then a concern about political fallout. And interestingly enough, we are at this bizarre state right now where Fox News says that 83% of Americans favor a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants brought here as children. And it's rare in this country that we would have that kind of a consensus. So the political fallout, interestingly enough, isn't as great as one might think. There is work that we can do beyond traditional scholarships, and some of you may already be doing this. With DOC or TPS, you can certainly offer on-campus employment. You can have paid internships or fellowships without DACA or TPS. There is still the opportunity for a scholarship or fellowship awards for internships or experiential fellowships, and Miriam's gonna speak to that. So I'm gonna jump right into having us hear from the experts. Uh, we've got President Smurley from uh, Christian Brothers University, a private college in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, President Smarelli has been a long champion to DREAMers and committed to serving DREAMers as part of the, the institution's mission. Uh, given it's a private college, it meant that he had to raise additional funds in order to enable DREAMers to afford what is a more costly tuition and fees. And he has been quite masterful in that, so he'll, he'll talk with us about it. We also have Melissa Pizzo, or Missy as we know her. She's the Executive Director of Financial Aid and Scholarship Services at ASU. ASU has embraced its support of DREAMers for several years now, going all the way back to the time when Arizona voters adopted a, a resolution that said in-state tuition would no longer be available to undocumented students. It's been a long journey since then, but ASU has both used private scholarship funds as worked closely with the Arizona Board of Regents to actually make available to DREAMers what is called a non-resident rate, which is not out of state, 
It is 150% of in-state, but at least a chance of being affordable. And then we've got uh, Miriam Feldblum, who is co-sponsoring this. And Miriam has a long history in, in financial aid, so she's going to be able to speak to that. But in particular, I'm really excited to hear from her about some innovative approaches that are beyond scholarships. So uh, President Smiley, we're going to start with you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? No problem? Right. I can. Okay, Andy. This is great. Um, what a great opportunity. I want to thank, I want to thank uh, Candy for the invitation and Miriam for the invitation to, to do this. Uh, we're, I'm at an institution very, very fortunate because uh, the first bullet point I want, to, I want to make and make it very, very clear, clear is the fact that um, this has got to be part of the institution's mission. If it's not, I think at this point in time, it becomes a very, very difficult process. So I'm, I'm at a LaSalle University. Uh, Jean-Baptiste de LaSalle is our founder and, and as our founder, his, his mission was to reach out to those wherever they are in their educational experience and to, and to educate them. And so really this has been sort of a, a normal procedure for us in, in, in West Tennessee, being in Memphis, uh, where uh, there's a large number of, of, of undocumented individuals, a large number of DACA recipients in our area. So for, first and foremost, we, we had the numbers that we didn't even think we would have, but more importantly, we had the, a mission that said, we need to do this because this is part, this is incumbent upon our mission to do this. The second piece, again, we're, we're a small institution. We're about 2,000 total students. But what the sense was, was how are we going to be able to afford uh, this process? So, you know, clearly I had to bring the, the board into this process. And even more importantly was getting key donors in our region. We're very, very fortunate in Memphis that there's a number of, of foundations who anonymously do a lot of, of very, very good work for our, for our region. And and uh, at, at the point where I said, how many of these possible dreamers do we have as we be begin a, a new program? Uh, I, I work very closely with Ann Kenworthy, my vice president of enrollment management. Again, she's the, been the hard worker of this project. I, I sort of provide vision and, and opportunity, and she, she does the hard work. And so really, in, in year one, we started with about 25 of these individuals. And, and we thought there'd be one or two. And as we kept going on, we kept going on. And and we found that there'd be 25 in year one. And and we went to the donor and said, you know, we need some, some significant dollars because these individuals cannot get Pell, cannot get the, uh, we have a Tennessee scholarship, a lottery scholarship called Hope. They can't get that. So how are we going to be able to afford um, a, a private school tuition? So really the, the donor was, was more than willing uh, if we put some skin in the game ourselves, so we discounted our our private school tuition for for the dreamers in a very very similar way to the way we would discount it for for any traditional student. The second thing we did was said, can the donor provide the the backfill, the Pell, and the hope that these uh, dreamers did not qualify for? So we did that that, and the donor was very very good about that. The results from year one were just incredible, where 24 out of 25 of the initial students. Um, uh, were very, very successful going from first year to second year. With that said, I went back to the donor and said, we need a longer term commitment given the success of our, of our program. And so we really are uh, we're really excited about what's happening. It's transformed our campus in, in, in a major way. The number of dreamers and undocumented students continues to grow. Uh, we are now able, because of what we've done so far, is to partner with the Dream US. And I want to thank Candy and and Don Graham and the and the Dream US folks who have made made this possible to be able to expand our our particular program and and to keep it going. The other piece that's sort of interesting now, as I as I listened to the first half of the of the panel, was the fact that the whole ISA a, a concept. We essentially had created an ISA, but didn't even know it in many regards because we expected the Dreamers to be able to pay a small amount of their tuition. So in essence, as they began their 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 time at CBU, they also were going to be contributing some like $25 or maybe $50 every month. That that would be sort of a we call it a pay it forward fund. So we we self we sort of self funded that ourselves. Uh, and what we wound up doing is putting money into into our own our own accounts, and in doing so, we could then pay it forward to to future dreamers. And that was really pretty exciting. But now that I hear about the whole ISA concept, I'm, I've got some new ideas in which to which to go forward. And really, it, uh, the, the third thing is just a political thing. And I think that's really as a, as a 
you know, as a private institution with folks out there who don't really understand the fact that one, they're not getting special treatment. We are not giving additional scholarship dollars to these uh, to the dreamers in comparison to our our, our non-dreamer students. So really, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's me speaking as a public face of the university, saying, you know, we're not taking money away from you. We are we are providing the same financial assistance as we would uh, your freshman uh, class uh, comrade here. The key is having the donor being able to be helping to offset the, the additional dollars that the, the residents here cannot, cannot get and the citizens cannot get. So really that's what we were able to do. And in doing so, uh, you know, we, we were very, very successful. They said they, they have transformed our campus in so many ways. Our, our, our sort of local students are learning so much more about, about the world culture and, 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 and the world itself. And it's been, it's been great for us. It's been one of the, the highlights of my career as a, as a college president to see what it's done to our campus and just the opportunities there and to be the face of, of what's going on. I mean, do you lose other donors? That is, there's a question that was, that was stated. Uh, we lost uh, a few donors who, who done, didn't understand or didn't believe in what we were doing. But in general, uh, given the mission of our university, it, it was just a great opportunity for us. And we're very, 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 very uh, grateful to the local donor and to Dream US and some other donors who have been responsible for allowing these individuals to, to get a college degree from CBU. Good. Thank you so much. And I should have shared. So CBU sits in Tennessee. Tennessee does not yet have in-state tuition, although increasingly there are some state institutions that are finding ways to give it. But a CBU stepping up and taking students from Tennessee was critical. But beyond that, President Smarillelli and Ann Kenworthy, who he's mentioned, also joined our opportunity program and have been accepting students from outside of Tennessee, from states like Georgia and North Carolina, which we refer to as locked out states because they cannot get in-state tuition in any way. And uh, in Georgia aren't even allowed into the top universities. So it's been fabulous to have CBU as a partner. Right, so now I'm gonna switch to the public school perspective. And Missy's going to talk with us about ASU's mission and its journey, both in providing scholarship aid, but also in working with ABOR, Arizona's Board of Regents, in creating a modified tuition rate. So, Missy, off to you. Great. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Candy, for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to share um, the public school experience, and more specifically, Arizona State University and what's occurring in the state of Arizona. Um, Candy, you alluded to this a little bit, that it's been a, a long timeline, um, actually for all of us, right? A lot of folks on the phone and in the webinar, I see you're participating from public institutions, so you probably have some similar experiences as well. Um, to give some context, Arizona State University is a large public research university in the Phoenix metropolitan area. We have four campus locations across the Phoenix metropolitan area, and we are one of three public universities in the state of Arizona. We are the only public university in the Phoenix metropolitan area, which is uh, the fifth largest city in the country, so we do serve a lot of students here in the area. Um, we do also have an online program for students to participate in as well, so again, we provide instruction in person and online. And um, as I mentioned, we're one of three public universities in the state. We all three are governed by the Arizona Board of Regents. So they are the policy board and uh, the governing board. So all three universities work very closely with our Board of Regents. All that being said, Arizona State University, you can see um, what our mission is, obviously, as a public research university. Um, we certainly want to be measured by whom we include and how they succeed. Um, obviously committed to research and discovery, and we are here to support our communities, and that's the economic, social, and cultural health of all of our communities. So um, our president of the university, Dr. Michael Crow, has been with us since um, 2002. So he's been part of this journey as everything's been occurring in the state. In 2006, um, Candy alluded to this, there was a voter referendum that was approved. Um, it's um, often called Proposition 300. And that's where the voters um, passed this referendum that ultimately says, um, if you are not a, a citizen or a permanent resident, 
um, you uh, and you're without lawful immigration status, you do not have access to tuition waivers, um, fee waivers, grants or scholarships, um, financial aid, tuition assistance or other financial assistance um, if it is subsidized or uh, subsidized or paid in whole or in part with state money. So in essence, really saying no institutional aid. Um, the state of Arizona does not have a state aid program for all intents and purposes. Um, so yet another um, uh, challenge that we have within the state. Um, at that time, again, that was in about 2006. And we um, worked closely with um, national partners, local partners, business community, um, raised money to assist our students who were currently enrolled at that time, who then went from paying a resident rate to a non-resident tuition rate. Um, in conjunction with our partners, um, about $6 million was raised to assist those students to at least uh, be able to complete their degrees. Um, over time, we know right at the national level and local level, things have um, occurred um, in the courts. Um, I think it was about 2015, there was a trial court that indicated um, DACA students would be allowed to get in-state tuition. And so it was about that time that then, you know, things shifted a little bit for our student population where they had the ability to benefit from in-state tuition. Um, Interestingly enough, our Board of Regents had also been working on um, coming up with a, an additional tuition rate that our students could benefit from. Um, and that's what you're seeing on the screen, the non-resident tuition rate for Arizona high school graduates. So there is some criteria behind it. Students need to have um, attended and graduated from an Arizona high school um, for a minimum of three years, um, meet some other criteria as well. Um, so I guess I want to point out it's actually pretty broad based. So it it doesn't need to be the DACA student. There can be other students who are falling within this category as well. Um, again, our Board of Regents was working on that and that had been put in place and was um, active for the fall 2015 semester. Um, but as I just mentioned, in 2015, there was kind of the the ruling that students could benefit from the resident tuition rate. So for all intents and purposes, this didn't necessarily go in, I mean, it went into effect, but not a lot of students were uh, benefiting from the new rate. Um, in April 2018, there was um, yet another court decision um, that then said no, students could no longer benefit from that resident rate. Um, so then at that time, um, for this fall 18 um, term, the students then had the ability to qualify for the non-resident tuition rate. Um, if they had that um, Arizona high school graduation component and so many years in the Arizona high school. Um, what I'd like to point out, what has been occurring at the university across this time frame um, has been the very direct support from the president and leadership at the university. Um, in, in When the Supreme Court decisions were coming down, when um, federal conversations were occurring, our president and our academic leadership stepped up and communicated very directly with our students and informed them that, of course, you know, we, we would do everything within the law, right? We do still need to follow the law, um, but anything we could possibly do to help our young citizens, um, you know, move, move forward, right, with their education and their lives regardless um, of what brought them to this country. So through that announcement and support of our students, our president also um, worked to kind of activate um, specific folks within the university to help work on larger efforts. Um, one of them being obviously some congressional action, what can we be doing at the federal level? How are we engaging our, our staff who work at that level? What are we doing locally? How can we engage our local business community and our um, local partners in policy work as well? Again, either at the national or state level. Um, working with our legal team. So we obviously have our, our general counsel at the university. We also have a law school at the university. So engaging and um, connecting with those individuals and those resources and helping students through um, their experience, um, through their application processes. Um, engaging and activating our um, ASU Foundation. Um, as Candy mentioned, and, and as a public institution, right, we cannot provide institutional funds. You know, I gave you a little bit of that overview. So private donor funds are critical to us and our student success. Um, so it's been a continued engagement of our ACU Foundation staff and team working to help raise funds. 
and also, you know, looking at who are other institutional partners in the country or throughout the world who could help our students access education. So um, from the university perspective, you know, we're activating folks on all fronts in, in ensuring we can help our students. Um, the additional information you see on the screen um, does talk about our scholarship information for um, students to apply to. It's called the Dream Fund, and it is funded solely from private donor funds. Again, that is the only way students can receive funds. They cannot receive institutional funds. And that continues to be our fundraising efforts and our mechanism and application um, entry point for students to, to submit the application. Um, to determine eligibility for those private funds and then um, ultimately receipt of those private funds. So that's a little bit about it. our journey, our experience. And again, um, I'll reiterate, we, we are able to be successful with our partnerships with private entities and private donors who are willing to support our students. Good. Thank you so much. I will also just mention with ASU, in the early days when uh, only out-of-state tuition was available, not the resident rate and certainly not in-state tuition, what we did with ASU was partnered with them for their online program. So we were serving Arizona students by allowing them to use our scholarship to enroll in ASU's online program, which uh, was doesn't have an out-of-state rate. So that is yet another idea for those of you who are offering online programs. Okay, so I'm going to turn now, Miriam, to talk with you. Have you talk? If I can get my slide to move. Give me one second. There we go. So, Miriam, if you Great. would like to take us beyond scholarships and talk about some more innovative approaches. Absolutely. And thank you, Candy, and everyone who's been um, participating in this webinar. It's been wonderful to hear. And just to do a, a 30 second uh, overview about the President's Alliance, we're focused on supporting three populations in higher education, undocumented students, other immigrant students, including refugees, temporary protected status recipients, and international students. Uh, and with those three populations, we're focused on three kinds of work. First is connecting presidents like John and others in campuses with advocacy opportunities to support students and to advance po uh, positive policy change. Second is increasing awareness in education. So providing leaders and campuses with the information and data to make the case about the value and importance of immigration and immigrant students and students, staff, faculty, um, and the community. And then third, it's identifying, helping to develop, share best practices, such as the webinar today, um, to help campuses be as most be most effective in championing and supporting undocumented immigrant and international students. Um, and so that's how we fit in. We focus on federal, state, and campus levels of action. So as, as, as Candy mentioned, and really the majority of the focus of this webinar has been on access to the college, on tuition, and to really supporting the, the, the educational um, expenses of the student. And, and beyond in-state tuition, a good number, increasing number of private institutions are treating undocumented students as domestic students for the purposes of admission and financial aid. And that can be very important because even for those campuses who are need aware, who have, who have you know, not as much institutional funds, but at least putting the undocumented students in actually the bucket that they belong. Because as we all say, they're, they're Americans in all but, um, but, but legal status. And it's important for campuses to, to think about how are they treating undocumented students from the first moment forward? And what's the, um, you know, what are the restraints and constraints that campuses face? I'm actually not going to talk as much. I'm happy to answer questions about treating undocumented students as domestic, domestic students, but really moving on to what's happening on campus. So once students are on campus, as part of our equity and opportunity and um, our mission beyond, you know, whether it's a faith-based institution, a state institution, our goals as higher education leaders is to support students to come flourish on campus and then flourish beyond campus and ensure that our institutions are equity generators, economic mobility generators contributing to our communities. A key for this for students is that they're able to support their professional development on campus as well as get funding in their pockets so that they can be retained in college and graduate. 
And that's where these non-employment based educational funding opportunities come in. So um, I've shared with, uh, with the group our FAQ that we developed last year in collaboration with Hirschfeld Kramer lawyers. So this has been vetted by, by legal counsel and it's really opening up a scholarship or funding opportunity that's not employment based and therefore it's open to everyone. And in fact, you can create it on your campus, so it is open to everyone. It's not just targeted to undocumented students, but open to all. It's connected to the educational and professional development of students. It provides funding um, anywhere from five, it could be 250, 500, or 1,000 dollars for the semester that allows students to develop a, a, um, a project or participate in a type of internship that's connected to their work on campus, connected to their intellectual um, uh, interests. It doesn't have to necessarily be connected to their major. And one of the things that we're asking colleges, and this can also be, uh, Missy was talking about whether institutional, right, depending upon if you're a public institution, I know many here are, this could be also a scholarship or fellowship that's run by your foundation. Right, um, uh, Immigrants Rising, which is a, uh, a California-based organization, also has fellowships that are open to students nationally in California, but also open to students nationally, that have much larger um, stipends attached to it because it's also paying for kind of the, the um, expenses of the students. So this type of structure can also be used in an internship. Um, format in which the money is 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 larger because you're also paying for maybe room and travel and so on connected specifically to the internship. And I'll, I'll end and I'm happy to talk more about this, but I'll I'll end with the with the thought of taking a step backward on all institutions, something that Candy had also talked about, and auditing, reviewing all your policies and scholarship programs which may be, which in fact can be modified so to be open to undocumented students, which can't, are there some opportunities to create more fellowships that's connected to a foundation if you are a, um, a public institution? What are your programs that, um, that may be actually department-based? You can look at an economics department program that may have a fellowship to go work to be an intern uh, in a company and it may actually say U.S. citizen or permanent resident, but in fact could be open to DACA recipients. So it's not just at the centralized level of the institution, but it's actually asking your faculty, who may be really interested, in looking at their departments and looking at what they can do. And then asking your faculty, actually, to connect to national societies, who may also have fellowships and scholarships that are open to students that right now appear closed or are closed to DACA recipients, um, but can be open to a greater number, including undocumented students. And then I'll also end with having money in one's pocket in order to, you know, um, continue to do the work is so important for our students. Candy mentioned that, uh, you know, the overwhelming majority of the, the Dream.us scholars are working one to three jobs. So also thinking as an institution about emergency funding. And one of the things that our FAQ does is it provides from the National Student Affairs Professionals Association a survey that came out last year about all the different ways that colleges and universities are providing some emergency grant funding, which also helps students be retained, graduate, and then therefore the long-term investments for the college are, are, are significant. And I'll stop there. Okay, that's fabulous. And I loved going all the way back to our ISA discussion that Kevin also mentioned that ISAs can be used for emergency funding. Uh, so a brilliant use of them. Uh, Sadana, what do we have in terms of questions from our, our participants? Okay, so we have no raised hands at the moment, but we have a few questions that had come in during the ISA portion, if you'd like me to ask those now. All right. Um, I think that we can do that, although we may have lost some of our ISA panelists, but we'll uh, let's hear the questions and we'll see what we can do. Okay, how can we adopt or start an ISA? Right, so I will just say that, that well, Matt, are you still with us? I am. Good, why don't you answer this question? Well, I'd say that there are uh, a number of ISA providers. Um, there are, um, obviously, um, you'd want to talk to Kevin um, to, to learn more about the program that he has. 
there are private companies that are running ISAs. Um, our ISA provider, the one that Colorado Mountain College is using, um, is Vimo Education. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the programs, um, I would, you know, search the companies, um, get to know what their products are, how they work with the institutions. Um, it does take a bit of paperwork. Um, you have to engage in a formal agreement um, to share information. Um, and then the students have to sign an ISA um, agreement, which is binding. Um, to uh, the institution, but is administered on behalf of the institution by way of your provider. So um, just understand the relationship. It took us four or five months um, to get through the paperwork and to make sure that we were all um, clear on the expectations and our comfort and how to implement. Um, but uh, the providers are there. The, the, uh, the, the work um, has been done at least initially, and so you can view uh, the documents that are available um, and see which is the right option for you. Good. Very good. I will also add, we didn't touch upon this. Many who have started these programs start with juniors and seniors. Uh, Purdue did that. And the idea is these students are farther along on their path to graduating. And thus you can actually will have proof points earlier in time because they'll graduate and be able to start paying back. Also because they're farther along in their journey, in some ways you could think of them as a better investment. They've made it two years into it and are, are more likely to graduate. So you can think about starting it by, by only, tra only funding transfer students, only funding juniors and seniors, and then expand it as you go, which was exactly Purdue's journey. Uh, we gave you links throughout this uh, PowerPoint, including a link to Purdue's website. So there are many resources there that you can take a look at to see how others have structured them. Other questions, Sadana? Yes. Um, one other question. Will ISA be available to Dreamer students who want to obtain graduate level degrees? It's such a good question. When we have looked at this, we actually think that may be one of the best uses of an ISA for dreamers. And particularly from an investment standpoint, raising funds, convincing donors that this is a good path. Um, obviously, students who are going to graduate school are going to have much higher incomes and be able to share back their income. And it certainly is a need for dreamers because there are so few scholarships available to all graduate students, not just dreamers, but almost no money available to dreamers to pursue their graduate degrees. We're also starting to work with some colleges about some unique pro approaches and just discussed in, in an email exchange this morning, the idea of a future web, web, webinar on helping dreamers pursue their graduate degrees. So there'll be more to come on that. Any other questions, Sadana? Yes, and this one also came in during the ISA portion. How do you factor in the ability of undocumented students to gain income through entrepreneurship? Well, so that is an interesting question, particularly as, as they model, they build a model for the ISA. So the expected revenue uh, a student will in income, a student will earn based upon their degree. And if students do not have DACA and are unable to work, but will be working as entrepreneurs, it may be harder to do that. But I'm just convinced in my own mind that we shouldn't let that necessarily be a, a deterrent. It's just that someone will need to be brave in thinking about how we do it. And of course, if DACA goes away, it will definitely put the issue on the table about how we might be able to do that. Any other questions? Um, yes, right, one I, last one. Okay, okay this will be the last one then. Thank you. How would a student be able to apply for an ISA if they do not attend a partner college? Are there other alternatives similar to ISAs at non-partner colleges? Well, as, what we, as we've mentioned, the way that ISAs are coming into being is often by the institutions themselves. So a partner college might consider creating an ISA. Uh, there may be ISAs that are generally available, but most often it's a, to attend a particular institution and or we mentioned the coding academies, they'll often offer ISAs to help students pay. So it's often something that's being created by the, the educational institutions themselves and not by others. Great, and with that, I should probably, yes, one more, somebody wanted to add something? Yeah. 
Well, this is Matt, and I just wanted to add that um, if you were interested in starting an ISA, it could potentially be feasible to be run through, say, a community foundation or through a, a foundation or a non nonprofit organization that is um, not um, affiliated with a particular institution, um, and you could have the same effect. The only challenge would be that you'd have to have some commitment by the institution to share the students' data back with you, so that you understood um, when the students were, how they're progressing, um, how you know whether they've graduated and um, how to engage with the students and following them uh, post-graduation. So there are options, um, but I think that given that it's new, it's been more um, isolated or concentrated among the institutions, but I could certainly see um, where a nonprofit might create their own ISA program um, and then allow more flexibility for students to attend a variety of institutions. Good, very good suggestion. And of course, that is in some ways what College Possible has done, partnering with Better Future Forward and with Jack Kent Cook Foundation. All right, we are at time. I want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to do this. You are all taking innovative ap approaches to serving dreamers, and we are grateful for that. And I want to thank all of our attendees for joining, being willing to learn, exploring new ways we can support dreamers because Lord knows they certainly need us. Thank you all. We're signing off. Thank you. Thank you.